Just say something into your mic. Something into your mic. We're having a conversation. We are having a conversation. Best conversation yet. Totally. Flawless. Welcome to the Thriving Musician Podcast, where you go behind the scenes with musician, speaker, and consultant Spencer List to hear stories of how professional musicians navigated the inevitable financial challenges that arise on the path to creative freedom and get insight from industry professionals on how to break through to the next level of your finances, career, and art. Now, here's your host, Spencer List. Hello, and welcome to another episode of the Thriving Musician Podcast. I have a very special guest today. Miranda George is a writer and speaker about the social elements that create and sustain performance anxiety in musicians, including shame, instability, and adrenaline. She also writes about performance problems regarding those who have struggled with trauma, mental illness, addiction, and disability. In addition to over 60 articles she has written for her blogs, Miranda has also written for Classical Music Indie, Smart Music, and Instrumentalist Magazine. Miranda has been invited to speak in several public schools, universities, and in conferences such as the Texas Music Educators Association Convention and the Midwest Clinic. She recently accepted an invitation to speak for South by Southwest in 2019, and I know Miranda from playing in the One O'Clock Lab Band at UNT. We went to school together. So welcome, Miranda George. Hi, Spencer. Thank you so much for joining me. I'm happy to be here. So... I don't know what order I'm going to release these episodes, but this is my first podcast interview ever. Uh, I am honored. So we've been talking over the years and Miranda's story is really interesting to me. And we're going to get into that um, right away. So just to, for people who don't know who you are, can you give us an overview of where you come from musically and where you've come that has led you to now? Okay, I will try to be brief, but that's going to be hard. Okay, so I am a trained classical trumpet player. I have three degrees, including a doctorate. So technically, I'm Dr. George. That's what they call me. And I also have another side to my musical career where I'm a singer and a choral conductor, and I even have related fields in choral conducting and vocal pedagogy. And I started, I think I taught college for about five years at the University of Texas at Arlington. And I've performed alongside the greats of DFW, several uh, musicians who I think I can say are just knock it out of the park when it comes to this area. So I feel like I've had amazing experiences as a musician. Uh, I've been fortunate to be able to not only be a performing musician and a teacher, but also a writer and speaker on the topic of performance anxiety. That was supposed to be my thing. It was supposed to be the thing that made me uh, I guess, reputable to, you know, say you're going to a college where Dr. Miranda George is on the faculty, you're going to a school where they focus on mental health and ego and uh, students will get some kind of curriculum in, you know, all the reasons why they or the people they know may be struggling with performance anxiety or why they may be off in their intentions to perform well, things like that. What are their expectations? That was my little dream, right? But my little dream kind of took me somewhere else. (laughs) And the thing that was supposed to make me this uh, very unique hotshot, extremely hireable hotshot, ended up being the thing that saved my life, got me out of some toxic patterns and put me on the right path to where you and I are having this conversation. Really, I don't know that we would be having this conversation if it weren't for that. So that is kind of how I've arrived here. And now I'm 
a learning management systems coordinator and instructional designer for a company in Addison, Texas called PHP Agency. And I create learning materials for agents who sell life insurance products and who are also, you know, people who are not agents yet who are prospective and they're trying to uh, get their license, their state regulated licenses. So I'm creating learning materials for them, creating learning materials for the markets that we serve, things like that. So that's an amazing transition. And I want to get into that. But first, you mentioned some some toxic mentalities and things potentially in your music environment. Can we go about, through those a little bit? You want to go there? Those? Let's go there. Yeah. I'm weird and I smile when I talk about these things. <laughs> Nobody smiles when they talk about what these things. So, uh, well, so what was my dream? My dream was to become an orchestral musician, to have a dope orchestral performance career, maybe be a soloist on the side. That was the original dream, right? Uh, and there were many a bump in the road. I, I would constantly hit a wall, then be defeated, then try something new, hit a wall, be defeated. And that was just happening over and over and over again. And I didn't realize that I was dealing with, uh, I knew I was dealing with performance anxiety and I read lots of books on performance anxiety and none of them applied to me. I'm sorry. Either I was an anomaly of a human being who should let this go or these performance anxiety reads, these books weren't for me because they weren't addressing my problems. And it turned out to be the latter. Mm. Thank goodness. You know, Mm -hmm. (laughs) I'm glad I'm not an anomaly, uh, but I definitely considered that I might be one and that, you know what, this may be something I'll never be successful at and I just need to let it go. And how many people have that mentality when they quit or when they let something go? They don't think, well, there's something else to look at here. For me, I wouldn't, I wasn't going to let go until I found the answers. So it was about figuring out what's at the bottom of all this performance anxiety stuff and I was already a college teacher when I started working on it, which is hilarious because I guess I had enough talent to make it past barriers that people usually end up hitting and quitting. You know, I I had sufficient enough talent to make it past those barriers, normal barriers. I, to be clear, what I realized after I started discovering some authors, some researchers, uh, to name a few, Brene Brown, a shame researcher, vulnerability researcher, um, Kristen Neff, self-compassion researcher, writers like Maxwell Maltz, who wrote Psycho-Cybernetics, um, and then just related writers to that, like Bessel van der Kolk and uh, The Body Keeps the Score, talking about trauma. Um, I started digging into my story and... I think the language I read in those books made me pull on a thread that continues to be pulled four or five years later. And it was about this. When I was a kid, I wasn't told, Hey, you're enough. Uh, You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. I had my lovability and my worth dangled like a carrot on a stick in front of me constantly and not in a way that I could predict. It was never predictable. And then there was some negative reinforcement involved. So uh, my family got here in about the 70s, right? There weren't a lot of generations of people here to go, hey, make sure you speak English and your language, or my parents' language with Malayalam. Make sure you speak both languages to them. They're babies. They understand everything. They're going to be good. So I didn't learn Malayalam because my parents wanted to make sure I did well in school here. So that's a good intention, right? Except I never learned Malayalam after that. And I struggled to connect to my family. I struggled to connect to my family over in India. And that's just one of the ways in which I was a shitty child. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Can I cuss? It's, yeah. I'm, I'm cussing. Cool. Yeah. <laughs> Great. There's more where that came from. <laughs> so anyhow, um, after that, it was struggling in school while I had what I understand now I had attention deficit issues and when a teacher brought it up to my parents the teacher said hey she just needs to watch less tv like my teacher failed me 
my parents come from a culture where uh, getting psychological help is frowned upon. You know, Mm -hmm. just if you're if you need to see a therapist or a psychiatrist, you're crazy and the family has a crazy person. So there was a lot of shame there, too, with them. Cultural shame passed down. So I was failed there, made poor grades there. And I could never be bragged about at the holiday parties when all the moms were talking about their kids getting straight A's. So there was that. Uh, My God, my body was criticized all the time. You know, I don't know how, but somehow even from the single digit age, I was called fat and things like that, you know, which I haven't even recovered from. I can only manage it at this point. (laughs) Um, And there's that. So Mm -hmm. you see, like it just builds upon itself. There's just so many ways it's just that I could be not enough and it was over and over and over again in my childhood and rarely was I stood up for in a way that was significant enough to me to make me challenge what was being said I was just never enough until I got into band I got handed a musical instrument and it was slow to start you know I was whatever about it in the beginning but then I started practicing and with my practice, I got good job, Miranda, Mm. Miranda, great job, Miranda, this chair, Miranda, that chair, Miranda, first chair, Miranda, you're getting the solo. And I finally, for the first time ever saw my consistent effort being rewarded like an effort should be rewarded. It was not this, I'm going to do this and see what happens, you know, or, do something in that regard and then maybe eventually uh, somebody will go, oh, okay, you're finally a good daughter. <laughs> you're finally mm-hmm. a decent Indian kid. Um, finally, I was doing something where everything I was doing led to this, what I now understand as validation, mm. right? I was validated over and over and over and over again. And, you know, like I said, in the first three years, it was like, cool. But then I wasn't sure about going on. My parents made me stay in band and I showed them (laughs) (laughs) and I ended up becoming even more obsessed with it. Like all region competitions in school happened and there was so much competition and that was my forte. Just I ended up practicing like a maniac and the better and better I got, the more and more I practiced. It was just like once I got to this part, you know, this point where I'm winning at this thing. Now it's time to win at the next thing and get better and win at the next thing. And it was never ending. Uh, But I always accomplished what I set out to do in high school. (laughs) And the only, literally the only place that happened was in band, in my participation in music, in my culture that would have never happened. My body would never have been good enough. My intelligence struggled throughout school you know and I didn't know it was a sort of disability of mine that I haven't been getting help for I thought I was just stupid right not smart um except for like math which I can explain why I'm good at that but like it's aside from being Indian (laughs) (laughs) It doesn't work like that, y'all. It's not just you're Indian and you're good at math. That's not how it works. Um, But I guess when I got into college, it was a little bit more of the same thing. I was practicing. It was heaven. You know, I was in doing music all the time. I was excelling in all my classes. And, you know, all the practicing I did just kept getting better and better, 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 better. And then it was about age of 20. I burned my lip and it was right before an audition and I ended up getting a callus on my lip and that's such a small thing, right? How many of us have burned our lip playing and it's just whatever, right? But for the first time ever in nine years, I was unable to control my drug of choice, which was validation. For the first time, whatever goal I set out was now not guaranteed. It was no longer guaranteed. And instead of, now again, I was not helped properly. If somebody, and I did go up to teachers and say, hey, this has happened. They didn't go, okay, well, let's not, don't audition. We know how you play. You're good. Or, you know, hey, don't play right now and let it heal. Or 
here's witch hazel, vitamin E, here's all the things. Just why didn't anybody say don't play? Just like don't play. Mm -hmm. I just ended up cutting it further and it calloused, right? Yeah. Um, I had for the first time like a an unyielding paralysis <laughs> when it came to the audition. And I couldn't control how I played it. Play, I did the best I could. Didn't get what I, you know, the spot I wanted. Mm -hmm. And that's so silly. Yeah, I didn't get the chair I wanted, but that was the first time that's ever happened. And pretty much from then, I had been fighting to make up for that moment over and over and over. It was tr like it almost reg registered in a traumatic way. The trauma already happened. <laughs> yeah. the, the trauma for me happened you know, in my childhood. Right. Uh, but it was remanifesting itself right there. And then when I couldn't control the influx of validation I was receiving. And if that, if, if that is true, if, if I can't control this, if I can't have this validation, that means I'm not safe in music either. Mm. Right. Yeah. So what did I do? I fought and fought and fought and fought and fought where fighting was not even the best way to go about it if I had known better and I didn't. So again, sufficient talent. I had sufficient enough talent to make it past, right? Except I wasn't getting to where I wanted to be because you can't get to a place like that. Extraordinary music making with that kind of toxic yeah. uh, pressure, fear. And so uh, I was a very negative person. I, you know, taught after I graduated, but I was burned out, burned out, took about four years off, went to my grad school, had a very kind teacher. I went to Indiana University. It was a really great place for me to go because none of that negative crap was going to help. And so he really helped me let go of a lot of that. Still didn't fix everything. It was just me being back at the steady influx of validation. I made the top orchestra there several semesters in a row. Uh, my performances were getting better and better and better, but there was still that kind of hold back. I had one audition not go my way. And then it was the same thing over and over again. Mm. Right. And not going my way, meaning I was still in the top orchestra, but I just didn't get like, see what I mean? Yeah. Silly. It's just silly. And then I went to uh, UNT and I failed to have a successful audition years and years in a row and it was so bad that I was getting ready to not finish my day. I was just like this this can't be for me I called a friend of mine I was like I think I'm gonna quit uh my recitals were not very good they weren't I wasn't making the top win ensemble and this was after being in the top orchestra at the biggest school in the country and like what's going on it doesn't make sense and I was again making up for trying to make up mm -hmm. for that lack of control of the influx of validation. I didn't have enough to sustain me to the next performance until the next, once you, you get cut off from your source. So what did I do? I partied with jazz musicians and enter Spencer <laughs> into my life y'all. So I'm, <laughs> I decide to, you know, numb my feelings of failure with a lot of drinking, partying, I went to a lot of live shows. I don't regret that. I don't regret going to the live shows. I loved all the local musicians I got hip to. Um, and just, it was weird. I found my people there. And so I was like, okay, um, total failure at UNT. I think I should at least get my degree with a little bit of lab band experience. <laughs> and so I was like, all right, whatever. I'm, you know what? I just went into it thinking I don't have to be good at this. And my first audition went really great for a classical girls audition right and then the next one went better and then I was like holy shit what if I made Jay Saunders band what if I made the two o'clock then I could have something on my resume or recording on my resume uh who doesn't know Jay like this would be great mm -hmm. uh and then maybe I could have a college teaching career right <laughs> practiced really hard accidentally made the one o'clock and I was like okay I'm here I might as well like stay here that is I wish I could say it was much cooler than that I wish I could say yeah I'm just like the most killing jazz musician ever y'all hair flip you know it's not like that at all and then there was more with it you know I was the second female to make that trumpet section in 60 years after Jamie Dauber did 
and you know back then and I think it was like late 90s early 2000s somewhere in there Jamie Dobbert New York musician and then of course after me Allie Haney Mm -hmm. and it, it was there was something wonderful about it I was like, okay, if I'm here, I might as well learn how to do this better. <laughs> and then you and I were in the band together. Yeah. And um, I don't you know, I don't know that we talked or that we were that buddy-buddy. We weren't having all these philosophical discussions. I was just trying to survive that band. That's yeah. all. I was just trying to survive sight reading all the time. All the time. So uh, I left. And just being in that band was sufficient enough for me to get union work after I left the school. I got to play with members of the Dallas Symphony Orchestra and Fort Worth Symphony Orchestra but from being in the one o'clock. And I, that's just because one of the great big, you know, one of the big contractors in the area used to be in the one o'clock in mm. the 70s. And that's how that happened. It's just who you know. It's not about being the greatest musician. It's not about being so much. But that now I was getting work in that area. And here we come back again to... Yeah. I can't control my influx of validation. It's just that that pattern just keeps happening, except it's happening in front of the best musicians in <laughs> Dallas. I would have much preferred that takedown from my 20s at undergrad. You know, now I'm now I am having this jonesing for validation in front of the best people in the city. And, you know, sometimes I would survive. Sometimes I did not. I did not. Mm. I've tanked. I've bombed in front of DFW's finest one more times than I can count. And maybe it's in my head and I don't think it is. Sometimes it wasn't, you know. Uh, So I'd have to say right around that time, it was right around the time that I was getting more union gigs, trying so very hard to maintain the facade that I belong here, right? Instead of feeling I belong here Mm -hmm. in this professional realm. Um, thankfully my association with jazz musicians, you know, got me gigs with people I'm comfortable with, you know, and that, that was also something that kind of sustained me through the time. Um, got to play a couple national tour dates of a musical here and there. And just, it was really, it's nice to know the right people just to have a family in the community. Uh, there's the people that you want to be down with the, the, the badass musicians, right? But there's nothing greater than playing with people who you feel comfortable with, who you feel are already friends and they love you anyway. And it's just, that's the best to me. Um, That's where I felt the most safe. Like I had nothing to prove. And so I I guess I I was just done. I was defeated. I was like, what am I doing? Um, What's going on here? And just one thing led to another. And it was just really uh, the universe, like people say the universe bends to your will, the very alchemist. Um, sentiment and it turned out that I it's not that I'm an anomaly that there actually was a solution right and I found it first through doing Julia Cameron's artist way I was like okay obviously you know she she has this whole artist recovery thing going on and very 12 step and so I yeah it's very neat and and she has all these exercises that are cognitive and there's um, exercises that are creative and just like, Hey, devote two hours to being creative or, you know, two hours to yourself every week. I call it, she calls it an artist date. And I would do those, right. I would try new things like name 20 things you want to do. Oh, okay. And it was something that forced me to start living my life a little, you know, mm-hmm. you're going to go on a vacation. That was one of the exercises, plan a two day vacation or whatever. And that was later in the book. I was like, wow, this is crazy. And so I did that, but I went through that book over and over again. And while I was going through that book, someone hipped me to Brene Brown. And it wasn't like I was like, okay. (laughs) It was, hey, I think you would really dig Brene Brown's TED Talk. And it wasn't musicians telling me this. This is random freaking strangers Mm -hmm. um, saying, hey, have you seen Brene Brown's Power and Vulnerability on TEDx? And I'm like, no. Okay, I'll check it out. Didn't. Then the next person would say it. Then the next person said it. At some point, I was like, okay, fine. (laughs) I will watch this thing. And when I watched it, my brain exploded because she started talking about shame and shame was the thing that I understood as the barrier between me and my ability to perform for the first time ever. This was like 2013, 14, somewhere in there. And, uh, At first, I was like, oh, my God, everybody, everybody, 
read Brene Brown, read this thing. Y'all need to learn about shame. Shame is the thing. And, it, and it, <laughs> I can't tell you how many people were like, well, what is it about? What are you doing? Like, okay. Well, basically if you as a child in your developmental years were fed the message that you're not enough, you, all you have to do is just like excavate a couple of painful experiences, hold it up to the light, talk to somebody, get some empathy, get past it, move through it. And bam, you'll like know your story and then you can move forward and, and, and perform freely. Mm. And people were like, I'm good. <laughs> <laughs> you know what? I'm good. And, and, uh, I can't tell you how many people, uh, I started writing around that time, but I can't tell you how many people would rather read me write about my story. They, they would rather read my writing than go through theirs. Right. Because maybe there's the hope that I will say something that makes them realize what's going on in their story or what's going on in their mentality. I had a couple of friends say that to me, like, you know what? I actually like your articles. I think you should keep writing. And I was like, what? <laughs> <laughs> but this book is perfect. You know, like in my head, I was waiting for Brene Brown to write a performance anxiety book. I'm like, Oh my God, she's going to write a performance anxiety book. Mm. And then everyone's problems will be solved. And it turns out that she's not a professional musician right. and she has no idea. Right. They want to hear it from you. <laughs> they don't know. Well, yeah, they need to hear it from a musician. Yeah, right. they, they need to hear it from someone who knows what they've. Right. Brene Brown doesn't know anything about the symphony orchestra. Like, <laughs> She, you know, there's probably an equivalent in her world, but that not really, not when it comes to performance art, there's no equivalent to that outside of performance art it tops public speaking, but not even that yeah. just not. So there's an art to that, but not really. So the community, the, the social elements of being a musician, the psychological elements of being a musician. And so I was like, okay, this is crazy. I'm going to write about my problems and I'm going to write about them as they come to the surface. As they rise to the surface, I'm going to try to figure this out. Mm -hmm. And at first it, like I said, it was going to be my thing that brings me glory. I'm going to talk about the one thing musicians aren't talking about. It's shame. Uh, Brene Brown says, you know, shame lives and thrives with three things, uh, secrecy, silence, and judgment. And I was like, Oh my God. <sighs> No wonder musicians aren't talking about it. No wonder musicians yeah. don't want to talk about this thing. And so I went further and further and further into it, wrote a couple dozen articles. And uh, I think writing on you know, writing those articles just brought things that were buried even deeper, finally came to the surface, like trauma. I didn't realize that what I was dealing with was trauma. I thought trauma was a thing that people in the military deal with, and it is. But trauma is also a thing that, we as human beings deal with, we can be knocked into a state of feeling that we are unsafe constantly. And that this, this, everybody's different, right? One person and another person could experience the same trauma and one person could get out of it, you know, just fine. And the other person be locked into the state of uh, feeling unsafe for the rest of their lives and, and be thrown into patterns of survival until the end of time. Mm -hmm. And it be, if it's, especially if it's co-signed by society, those things can persist like body, like body shame. Right. So, uh, it turns out that I had and was dealing with patterns of complex trauma. And when my therapist bust out the trauma binder, I was like, what are you doing? What's going on? <laughs> what, what is this? Uh, are you just like informing me about trauma? This is a cool masterclass on trauma. But no, she was like, no, you, you're dealing with it. And here's what's happening. And here's why. Wow. So it wasn't like shame, like shame. It was trauma shame. It was complex trauma shame. And my, what was taking me down and what was locking me down in performance, I realized that I didn't, get into music because I love music and I chose it between all the things I could possibly do in this life. I'm like, Oh, I could be a math teacher. I could be an actuary or a math teacher. I could be, um, I could go into engineering if I wanted, I could be a doctor, medical doctor if I wanted or music. I want to go into music. It wasn't like that. It was a 100% clinging 
to music because it was the only thing that made me feel like a worthy human being. I think the most best way I can put it is it was the only thing that didn't make me feel worthless. I, yeah. I just clung to it and I clung to that validation that I kept getting over and over and over again. And, you know, uh, that was a horrifying realization because that would mean that this entire time that I've been struggling and this entire time that I've been striving to be a musician was just me making up for the hurt I felt as a child mm-hmm. for how many years yeah. we are talking now? We are now and talking degrees. and yeah. degrees and how many thousands of dollars yeah. and how many like there's things that there's got, you know, because we're talking about the fight or flight response, we're talking about chronic stress, uh, chronic stress and anxiety and the effect that it has on your health. I'm going to have, you know, issues with my health that were wrought by this and that will affect me for the rest of my life. Right. Uh, all this because I had a shitty childhood and I mean, relatively there were other good things about my childhood and that there were bad things about my childhood. And this was just a, a manifestation of a pattern. Right. So the answer was not to keep doing it. Yeah. Uh, that was probably the most painful decision. The most painful decision ever I've ever had to make was quitting my career, quitting this. And it's not because I wasn't a good enough musician. It's because I, as I do this, the longer I do it, I know I'm sustaining the wrong intentions of doing it. And I will never, ever, ever heal as long as I am coping, this is a giant coping mechanism. As long as I continue to use the coping mechanism, I'm never going to heal. So I decided to leave my career. This is not music outright. I didn't leave music outright. I just had to try to leave it for a while and come back to it when I'm healthier and happier and let it be something that enhances what is already a full life versus the thing that defines whether I'm having a life or not. So that is my story. And I left, um, well, it took like 200 job applications, five months of job searching, um, stress eating. I think I gained 20 pounds, (laughs) had a lot of good stress eating moments though. Um, I, I know how to turn food into drugs and that, that is through stress eating. So, um, you know, I eventually got this job as a learning management system coordinator at PHP agency. And the funny thing about that, we'll talk about in a second. I have something interesting to say about that, but that's where I, that's how I arrived here. That's really powerful and amazing. I'm sure people can relate, including myself. Um, can you talk about when you had this moment and so to sp- a light bulb, so to speak, might have may have gone off and you're saying, okay, I need to, I need to f- find something else so that I can come back to music in a healthy way. Can you talk a little bit more about that transition um, for people out there that might be listening, that might be going through something similar where they're questioning their relationship with music. Um, maybe their relationships changing with music and, if they want to go and find a job like you did, what does that look like? Because I'm imagining, you know, a freelance musician or even just, you know, even a university professor just suddenly switching to essentially something completely different. What does that really look like? So from the moment I left UNT, finished my coursework, I got a college teaching job. I didn't have to try that hard. I auditioned for it. I guess I turned in some paperwork, but uh, it wasn't hard for me to find and begin that part of my career, that academic part of my career. I already had my career going as a performer, right? There's that, what's missing is that rite of passage. You know, for musicians, it's very gradual. It's, you do one gig, then you do the next gig, you get to know this other person, this other person brings you on a gig, and then you end up building your network, and then you get more gigs. Like I said, I ended up getting these fat union gigs just from knowing somebody who used to be in the one o'clock. That was how it happened for me. 
That's not how it happens in the real world. It can. Now, don't get me wrong. It can. You can get a job and start a career in the corporate world, say. You go there uh, through somebody you know. But for me, it was me writing a resume, finding out that my resume is garbage. (laughs) My resume writing, not the resume itself. The resume writing was garbage. I had to find another friend who was a musician who had to learn how to write his resume. And he gave me all these tips, my friend Richard. And then I utilized a resume writing service, but Richard did a really great job saying, you know, there's a way you can word your resume to being corporate friendly. You know, how many times do we use office applications in our work? How many times do we use um, things, you know, skills like filing, scheduling, creating a syllabus, creating a curriculum for our students. How many times have we had to learn communication? Things like that. There are ways to put on your resume the exact skills that you've picked up from your career. And I think that's something musicians don't understand. I don't think they understand that they do have marketable skills. Many, 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 many. They don't think they have marketable skills, so they don't think they can get a job. So what did they settle for? Starbucks, if they can even get that, like Starbucks can be hard to get. Um, There's a lot of millennial company, young millennial companies out there who will see somebody who's in their 30s who's had, you know, a seasoned performance career, not really seasoned, starting to be seasoned performance career. But now they want to go out of music and and everybody who's getting the jobs are younger than them, that sort of thing. So it's uh, it is definitely recognizing that you have marketable skills, talking to somebody who knows what they're talking about you know, when it comes to resume writing, you may want to utilize a professional service, utilize your friends who are not musicians and ask them, Hey, you know, do you know anyone who's in hiring? Do you know anyone who's a corporate, uh, recruiter? What are they looking for? What is it like now? And you can look at blogs. There's lots of, lots of blogs out there. Um, but talk to people, actually talk to people and ask them what they think. Uh, cause there's a lot of great tips out there. You will, if you're anything like me, go through the grueling process of applying for jobs and you'll put a lot of energy into it. But here's the thing. Applying for a job is a job. If you're not um, looking at it that way, you may get hit in the ego every single day. And when you apply for a job, you may not be responded to. You may be responded to and then never heard from again. You know, they may never talk to you after that. You may get one interview and then they don't want you anymore. You may get two interviews and then they don't want you anymore. Maybe you don't get an interview for months and I didn't, you know. Um, you know, uh, the great thing about taking an interview is you get better at interviewing. <laughs> and so at least there's that. And if you look at it as a learning opportunity, you can actually move into another field easier than you think but you've got to have some grit you're going to be disappointed and you're going to need some support to deal with that disappointment and it was hard I reached out to several of my former you know professional musician friends who are now in jobs like I am uh, like corporate jobs and I would reach out to them and say hey this is so sucky this sucks I'm like freaking depressed And they're like, yeah, it is hard. It is hard. It sucks. I know how you feel. And, and that kind of get me, got me to the next batch of, uh, applying for jobs. And I got to say some of it's luck. Like I ended up in the perfect position and two companies wanted me at the same time. One paid $10,000 more. And I got to choose the one that paid more, which is nice. And the other job was going to be a limited uh, customer service oriented type job. This one I took ended up being, get this, this kind of stirred pot of all of the hobbies and creative activities I did on the side while being a musician. So part of it is teaching and creating curriculum. That's all stuff from my career. However, creating art, writing, I would have never, and uh, before I even started writing my performance anxiety stuff, I wrote like 
an entire blog on one summer of being a grocery store cashier. And I don't know if you remember that. It was like humanity through the lens of a grocery store cashier. I loved writing. And that's something I did on the side. And now it's my job to write. And that's insane to me. That's insane to me. And uh, now I'm this Mary Poppins bag in my brain of abilities is all being utilized. And it's a surprise every time because uh, they just want me to come up with ideas. It's 100% an innovative solutions oriented job. And that is directly related to the valuation of the company. And never in my wildest dreams did I think that the things I was doing on the side of my striving to be a, an acceptable classical musician, never did I ever think that that was going to be earning me a salary and giving me insurance, putting food on my table, giving me a place to live, all that stuff. I never thought that would be it. And how much of my energy did I spend just trying to make it as a musician before I ever cared about that stuff? Wow. Can you take us through, so through all this transition, what was the response from the music community? Um, I had several musicians say, are you going to still play? Are you going to still play? Like, I felt like from the music community, there were some people who were in that same exact struggle who were like, oh my God, good for you. Huh. You know, and, and they're looking for somebody else to do it so that they can feel empowered to do it themselves. I had some people who, oh my God, if Miranda's leaving, that makes me question what I'm doing. What am I doing? You know? And I think that some people distance themselves from me because my decision to leave and put myself first, blimey, but you know, put myself first, that means uh, they might have to address that part of themselves. And that is far too uncomfortable for some people who live beside and behind sorry behind the facade that they so carefully construct you know okay y'all do do what you need to do I'm gonna do what I need to do and I have I'm stupefied that what was keeping me from thinking bigger not just for what I can create but for the life I could live what was keeping me from living a bigger and better and more amazing life was me trying to fit into a box to check off all of the, here's what you need to do to belong with this community or whatever. Here are the Facebook posts you need to be able to make to be cool enough to be with the hip kids or whatever BS musicians do, right? I do not miss that. So, <laughs> but I participated in it because that was the way, right? So, um, you know, I, I was trying to keep my... I was trying to make it. I was trying to be accepted in this community. I was trying to do what greats do in this community, at least striving for it. And what I didn't realize is that I was cutting myself off from an, an abundance uh, by trying to be what everyone else, what is acceptable, what our, our society deems acceptable, our musical society. What is an acceptable post to make? What is an acceptable thing to put on a resume? I was keeping myself small by striving for what was supposed to be big in our world. So now you've moved into this new world. What is your relationship with music like now? Well, it's like, um, have you ever had a breakup before? <laughs> yes. <You're> like, <laughs> yeah. Okay. Have you ever like had a bad breakup, yes. like a bad breakup? Yes. Mm. And it wasn't like the person was evil. It was just the worst breakup of all time, <laughs> right? This is the worst breakup of all time. We're talking about the most heart-wrenching breakup. The kind they make movies about, except it's me and my career and not <laughs> me and whoever Ryan Gosling is playing, right? Yeah. It's 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 the biggest heartbreak of my life. No man has ever hurt me like the disappointment and betrayal I've felt with my career, right? Because my career ended up being just uh, an avatar of sorts for the heartbreak my parents did, you know? It was just my heart, my parents, my heartbreak I felt from my parents. And they did the best they could, but that's heartbreak. And it just became this 
uh, manifestation of that heartbreak and I didn't recognize it as heartbreak because of the validation I was getting over and over again and it just ended up I ended up realizing wow I am never going to know and I do not know what love is with this this is not love this is survival I've just been in survival the whole time so uh yeah I now I sing still I'm in a choir where they offered, uh, the director offered for me to be a section leader, but I turned it down because I want to be able to say no to it, which is a power I've never known, right? Saying no to music. Um, I wanted to sit back. Thankfully, everyone's good at, you know, a lot of people are good at singing in the choir. It's one of the best, you know, choirs of volunteers I've ever seen they have hired section leaders things like that and the literature is great uh the director picks really really great literature and it's 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 all the things I love but with much more health (laughs) than I've ever known right and I I've had a lot of people say are you going to pick up the trumpet again and that's like saying Pretend my ex-boyfriend was named, uh, I don't know, Phil or something, right? Hey, are you going to hang out with Phil anytime soon? No, I'm not going to hang out with Phil. (laughs) Why are you even saying that? Like, are you the shittiest friend ever? Don't you know? People don't hang out with their ex. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. Y'all are not shitty friends. You are caring, kind people. But I'm saying, (laughs) this is my ex. I can't hang out with my ex right now. I've got to work out all of the rotten things about what went on and and let go of all that just rework what i what i need what my needs are and what i deserve and what is healthy and maybe it comes back to my life maybe it doesn't it doesn't have to uh it would be sad breakups are sad but i think if it and when it does come back to me it's going to be amazing healthy so a lot of things that i talk to with my audience and clients and when i give talks is about personal finance and music business and mindset mental health things like that so we would be amiss if we didn't talk about money a little Mm, bit so with all of the things you've been through let's just throw some money on that fire um so Uh. I'd like to ask you, these are questions that I ask all of my clients in the first session. And it's a session of self-awareness because I believe that we can't go anywhere unless we really understand where we are Mm. and uh, where we come from. So are you ready? Oh, yeah. Bring it on. A little bit of a rapid fire. Let's do it. So what is your relationship with the idea of money? And that could be you love it, you hate it, it stresses you out, you know, your level of knowledge about it. Does it keep you up at night? Things like that. I am now in a state of mind that I deserve money. I deserve more money. And what I could do with money could help me have the life I want and do not only have the life I want, do good things, connect with people. I could help others. There's so many great things I could do with money. And, uh, you know, to the end of my time, heck, I could end up using that money and pass it on to my nephews, things like that. I'm thinking, you know, you, you can, with money, you can think of others. And so I have a very healthy relationship with it now. That's amazing. So what was your relationship prior to this? Um, I was more concerned with making it as a musician than I was in being a financially autonomous person. My parents were stellar with money and no matter, no, there was no amount of verbal abuse I could give them that would make them buy me the candy I wanted at the store. They were too busy trying to afford the five cars that they would eventually buy for us. Or they, uh, you know, all at once having five cars going with this entire family and then, uh, they were too busy planning for the vacations that I would take for granted as a child, right? Uh, but no, I wanted that bag of peanut M&Ms, you know? They were incredible with money. And 
they were also, and this is part of that cultural gap, we weren't communicating. Um, my dad meant well when he said no all the time. He did give us an incredible life, and I think he wanted us to learn how to have an incredible life too, but wasn't the best teacher. <laughs> he wasn't the best teacher. When I asked for money, it was also, it was always why, and then I would tell him why, and then he would just kind of begrudgingly give me a check for whatever I needed, and it would be things like private lessons, like, I thought we agreed this is fine, you know? <laughs> It seemed like a burden every time. And so that's just kind of the message. It was just another one of those messed up messages. Like you are not allowed to have money. That's the shame. Like my financial shame tape is you cannot be trusted with money. And here's how that manifested, right? As soon as I got money, what did I do? I spent it all like I had it, right? Like I had some. Uh, the first credit card I got maxed out quickly because finally I didn't need to ask burdensomely, you know, I didn't have to be a burden to my dad to get money. I now had money on this card and it was just as much a manifestation, you know, this numbing device spending money as anything else was. And so, and I maxed out that card twice and then I finally just like cut it because I couldn't be trusted with it. Right. And that was, I had more than one card at that kind. And my dad, of course, saw me make the mistake. What did he do? He paid off the cards. Yeah, mm. not a good thing, right? I, th I know as a young person, I was relieved that he did that. Right. <laughs> and how amazing that you have a fund for your daughter's fuck ups. You know what I mean? Like, it's amazing that you're so good with money that you can handle your daughter being ter with terrible with money, right? He just didn't want me to pay the interest and rightly so. And he even said, don't make these companies rich. And, and I could go back now and maybe take all of his lessons he was trying to teach me. Maybe he wasn't a terrible teacher. Maybe I just couldn't hear it because I was too busy trying to be lovable. And he probably said amazing things. He probably said, you know, I remember him saying, you know, banks, they do these things to make money. You are making them rich. Stop making them rich. Pay off anything you buy. Don't buy clothes with a credit card. Don't buy things that decrease in value with a credit card. And he, God, he was so amazing with money. He'd buy cars with cash. Like That's the way to do it. Yeah, he would buy cars with cash. He said they, they go down in value. Don't put something on credit like that that goes down in value that isn't an emergency. And so... I didn't know. I didn't know. He didn't communicate to me the whys of what what was going mm -hmm. on. All I could see was the result of what he was doing. And, you know, to add to that, they now are retired. And I found out that they have annuities and they have all these amazing <laughs> products. Like my mom has a million CDs, uh, certificates of deposit that she made with every single paycheck. And, you know, my dad was with companies all his life for the majority of his life 401ks and things like that right all rolled over uh they le lived humbly but they also don't live humbly like <laughs> they are traveling they're going yeah. everywhere they they're living th the retirement that most people want to have yeah and like we haven't had a sit down until recently until I joined the company that I'm in and now I'm licensed to sell uh, life insurance and health insurance. I'm a licensed person. I don't, but I do it for the, I'm licensed for the education, the curriculum that I develop. And then I finally went, holy freaking smokes. I went to my dad and I said, do you have all these things? Do you have an annuity? And he goes, yeah, we have two annuities. I'm like, what? When were you going to tell me this? Like, who are your beneficiaries? What's going on? Like, I finally, I'm having this conversation with my father that has never, ever happened, even though the whole time he was setting himself up, setting himself and my mom up for this incredible life, right? Yeah. Hard as it was, whatever. Everybody's life is a little hard, but uh, why didn't you sit me down and have, and maybe he tried, but we just didn't have the rapport, the relationship to do that yeah. and I wasn't remotely curious and neither were they I mean they were just waiting until I had a steady career going and that wasn't happening um I had teaching jobs I was sustaining myself somewhat but I didn't really 
I didn't really super self-sustain until semi-recently, mm-hmm. not until recently. And it's not easy. Um, I didn't prioritize being financially responsible or trying to be more financially responsible until my 30s. Why did I wait so long? Well, I was too busy surviving. So yeah. I don't blame myself for that. And then because of my, you know, the people pleaser child in me coming back, that people pleaser child coming back to haunt me in my my adult life. Um, it wasn't about being financially responsible. It was about looking financially responsible. I wasn't putting as much energy in being financially responsible, budgeting, all that stuff as much as I was participating in the activities that someone does participate in when they have money and when they have it together. It was about the facade. It was the facade I was building. So I was, and it, and this is the painful part, right? So I'm letting go of my old patterns. And part of those patterns is my unyielding avoidance of paying attention to my finances. If I don't look at it, if I don't think about it, it's not a problem, right? (laughs) I would private teach, right? I would collect all these checks and I would, you know, there would be like, the, you know, after you pay your taxes, like I'm going to be so diligent about this and you make that little (laughs) promise to yourself that you will and you start writing checks down and their dates down and you start doing your mileage and this and that, right? Because you are so responsible, but then you just don't do it one week. Like I'll catch up. And then you don't do it the week after that. And then you're like, you stop writing it down. You start taking snapshots of it instead. And then it just devolves into negligence, right? Or maybe I'm just talking about myself. I know I'm not talking about myself. There is somebody else out there that is just like me who was super lazy with their receipts, super lazy with their mileage, super lazy with recording their checks, right? I at least took care of the checks, thank goodness, because like I didn't, you know, I was lazy when it came to deductions, but I was always afraid of not reporting every check. So uh, because that the IRS will get you, you know, so they already know what you've earned. They already know what you've earned. Don't lie. So um, that's that's that. And I just, you know, it's not until now that I appreciate uh, at least having witnessed what financial responsibility looks like, because now I can have a mental, I have a mental imagery of it. Mm-hmm. I remember my dad being so diligent about bill paying, about recording. Oh my God. He does like volunteer accounting for the church they're in. Like, and he didn't, he wasn't an accountant. He was a programmer, you know? So a database manager or programmer person. So you don't have to be an accountant to be good at money. And got do you like money do you like having money then get get curious about this because ugh. i mean i was just i'm now just catching up from all of my irresponsibility mm-hmm. and it's going to take me a while like it's going to take me a while but my attitude is uh it's never too late so certainly it hurts it sucks yeah. it sucks all that negligent not reporting my deductions that sucks However, I can learn, I can change, I can move forward from here. And part of that was getting a new career, one with upward mobility. And the other part of it is just, you know, no more avocado toast, beans and rice. Just do it for a while. I'm I'm now, I'm thinking much bigger and I'm thinking, what sacrifices do you need to make to get the life you want? And what do I, what knowledge gap do I have? And what do I need to fill what knowledge gap do I need to fill to get help myself get the life I want in the future? Mm -hmm. That sort of thing. That's where I am at right now. And there's lots to learn, but I at least believe I'm capable. That's awesome. You basically answered most of my questions (laughs) that I ask my clients. It's awesome. You just kind of went through them without knowing. Oh, it's awesome. (laughs) Um, So, but I want to know when you were more connected with the music community, I want to know a little bit more about money and music and your experience in the community and the music community's idea of money. I have my thoughts. Uh So I just want to know what your perspective was when you were in the thick of it, when it came to money. Oh, well, you know, when people get their degrees, it's to get a job. 
so they can earn money, right? Something weird about the music community is we all kind of accept as a community being poor, which I don't think all musicians are. And I don't think all musicians think that, but they sure don't communicate that that's not an acceptable mindset. I think it's the, you will struggle. It's it's normal to struggle. Yes, it's normal to struggle. However, um, it is not normal to, although it happens, it's not a natural inclination to let yourself be sacrificed for your career. That's actually not a normal human inclination. That is survivalist. So when it came to gigs, gigs weren't always happening in the beginning, right? So what did I do? I chose to do teaching. And I had a genuine interest in teaching, but now I realize much, much, much later, it wasn't as detached as I needed it to be for me to be successful, this and that, be good at it. I didn't, there was a lot I had to learn. But I was doing something I didn't necessarily love as much as performing to make up for the money I wasn't making performing. And I get get it, you need to supplement your income this way and that way. But nobody was saying, you don't have to do this. No one was saying, you don't have to be a teacher and be a performer. You could be in some corporate job, eight to five, and enjoy and performing your instrument. In fact, I wish, 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 somebody would have said, don't do that. Get a job, get a job, practice on the side, earn money, be healthy, have things like learn how to pay your taxes, learn how to pay rent, learn how to not spend money so that you can keep and, you know, take care of the things that you want to keep and take care of, right? I would have been able to afford all the instruments that I wanted. And trumpet's the cheapest freaking instrument out of all of them, right? I would have been able to buy the highest quality instruments that I love. I would have been able to um, say no sometimes. It would have been nice to say no to some gigs. And just, I don't know. Like, I can't imagine that all the way back then. What that would have looked like. The internet was just, was you know, starting to boom around that time. Uh, 2000 to 2002, right? Uh, late 90s. So it's hard for me to think back and think about what that would have looked like. I know um, it wouldn't have immediately solved mental issues I was going through, but I know for certain I would have learned how to become an autonomous adult. Heck, I may not have gone for those extra degrees. I may have just been able to stick to my original passion. So there, the, I guess, to be in the cool people club, you know, the people who can sustain themselves on a performance career alone, those people are the outliers, like good for them that they have that going. You don't have to do that. You can have your income come from different places. If it's about your art and if it's about being great at whatever it is that you want to create, just to uh, allow your art to become new for you to, I want to say this properly. I'm sorry. I'm just, okay. If you want to excel at your music making, if you want to get better, heck, afford going to the nicest teachers there are in the country, flying yourself out there and being able to have a, full life to be able to start preparing for the life that you want to have decades to come. Uh, go for it. Just, it's not about what it looks like for everybody else. It's about just earning what you need to have a good life and let your art develop and thrive. Ah, the thriving musician. So letting your art thrive from that, from that sense of, safety and autonomy because uh financial stress is a life ruiner and good luck letting your career blossom while you're trying to survive 
you know. So that's that. Where can our listeners find your work? Oh, okay. One day I will have a dot com. <laughs> One day. But I'm right now, I've got a Facebook page, Miranda George Articles. It's just facebook.com slash Miranda George Articles. I've got a new blog called The Noble Goal. Uh, so Miranda George Articles was me realizing shame was an issue all the way up to me quitting and leaving the career that was built on toxic intentions. And now the noble goal is me still processing some of those old things from my time as a musician and maybe seeing and developing the healthier attitude that might let it continue in my life in a much healthier way. That's called the noble goal. So that's facebook.com slash the noble goal. The websites, the blogs themselves are WordPress, WordPress blogs. So it's uh, Miranda George articles dot WordPress dot com, the noble goal dot WordPress dot com. They'll be becoming dot coms before I speak for South by Southwest because I don't want to say dot WordPress dot com at South by Southwest. I want to be a little bit cooler than that. So um, I also have a YouTube channel, which I'm about, uh, I've got to follow all the YouTube rules and get a fancy handle at some point, but I have to get a certain number of subscribers. So if you find the noble goal on YouTube and subscribe, I would be grateful. I'm doing a lot of vlogging there and I'm also doing animations and it's really, really fun just adding audio visual elements to what has only been writing all this time. And I have a Twitter and I have an Instagram that uh, my Instagram's Miranda C. George. My Twitter is Miranda George. Wonderful. So we're going to put links to all of that <laughs> in the show notes and every, all the resources you mentioned, we'll put that in the show notes as well. Um, Thank you so much for joining me. Absolutely. And I definitely want to talk to you more about this. Oh, sure. And in another interview, um, I hope this was helpful and I hope you have a great day. Keep thriving. Want even more ideas, tools, and resources on how to break through to the next level of financial and creative freedom? Check out the leading financial blog for musicians at spencerlist.com, where Spencer covers the latest trends and financial strategies. And by signing up for the Thriving Musician newsletter, you can earn exclusive member content and discounts. Get it all at www.spencerlist.com. If you would like to nominate a thriving musician for an interview on the podcast, request Spencer to speak at your school or event, or want to submit questions or comments, please send an email to spencer at spencerlist.com. And keep thriving.